Hello, International Grandmaster Ron W. Henley here, and uh, welcome to iChess.net uh, webinar. Today we will be discussing the hyper-accelerated and the deadly uh, accelerated Dragon Sicilian. Uh, so I can see why all these videos start out with someone asking whether or not everybody can hear them. Okay, so now I believe you should be looking at my chest-based screen there. Okay, and what we're going to look at today, first I'm going to share a couple of games that my students have. I'm just trying to see if I can uh, find where the chat is. Andrew, I can't find the chat. Okay, so now I see we're getting somewhere. I can see the chat and I can follow the video a little bit here, what you guys are doing. Okay, so let me know if you can see the chess based screen and we will go ahead and get started. Uh, first off, I'd like to talk about uh, iChess.net. Uh, Freddie Lansky and 
Will Stewart, a couple of very good friends of mine, and when they first started out, uh, in fact, Freddie took one video that had been lounging around, you know, in my basement for quite a while, a uh, game I played Judah Polgar back in 1992, and uh, he dusted it off, edited it, and threw it on YouTube. So I believe, uh, you know, they'll toss that link out there for you later to take a look. Uh, let's see. What we have today, of course, is we'll be discussing the uh, Ron Henley Master Method. And I believe they're selling the whole package for about $69.99. It's about 23 plus hours of Accelerated Dragon Sicilian. So that definitely will help you get your E4 opening repertoire into shape. So E4, C5. In the mid-90s, when I started to play chess again, it was a question of what type opening to play. Throughout my youth, I experimented with E4, E5. I played with the French defense for a period. In fact, during the tournament where I made the Grandmaster Norm in Indonesia, I actually had about three or four French defenses. I played the Cairo Khan for a while under the influence of uh, Karpov and Capablanca and so forth. And uh, I found that perpetually what would happen is once I'd lose an important game, I would blame it on the opening and I would move on to something else. However, in the mid-90s, when I came back after an extended career in Wall Street and decided to play tournament chess again, I really wanted something that was quite sharp. And by that time, chess videos had become more, uh, more available. And I saw some very good videos by Roman Jinjin Hashvili. And uh, I really took to the Accelerated Dragon because I really wanted something sharp where you could fight for the full point. And so the Dragon Sicilian is a bit too sharp and serious concerns about the Yugoslav attack that go all the way back to my childhood for two reasons. One, Harpov on the white side of the Yugoslav attack would win many crushing games. Uh, games against Gik from early in his career and later games where he would play an early knight d5 and trade queens and so forth and play these end games come to mind. And then of course there's the famous quote where someone was talking to Fisher about different variations of the Sicilian defense and why he preferred the Nidorf. And his comment was when they came to the dragon, he's like, oh, white just plays the Yugoslav attack, opens up the H file, check, check, and mate. And so whatever political agreements or disagreements you may or may not have with Fisher, when it came to chess, the guy knew what he was talking about. And in many cases, years and years and years later, we see that his opinions were quite valid. And so, uh, so I've always considered the Yugoslav attack to be a bit of a problem for black, problematic. Although that said, there are some things like work B8, you know, like uh, one of the Chinese players, Boo, specializes in and so forth. But why have the headache and learn so much theory to play something where you're really walking on the line? And so uh, I saw the Roman videos on the Accelerated Dragon. I really took to it. And it's been fantastic. A lot of my students also do very well with it. Now, I'm the director of chess programs at Miami Country Day School. And we get a lot of scholastic players starting out. And the typical type opening that you will see goes something like this. There's a lot of copycat going on. And it's very hard to win these games for white, but especially for black. And so what I've taken to doing is teaching a lot of my kids play the Sicilian, play something new, uh, relatively speaking, on their level. And so they win a lot of games. Now, knight c6, you can play the knight c6 move order, or you can play the g6 move order. Now, in the chat that I did see earlier, I'm having trouble finding the chat now, but bear with me. Uh, someone was asking about whether they should learn the hyper-accelerated or the accelerated. And let's just talk about that very briefly. If you play two knight c6, that can lead to the standard accelerated dragon like we get in this in this game, okay? Where we get all the, and that's kind of the start position for the accelerated dragon Sicilians, okay? Now, what's the difference? And it took me a long time to understand this too, so it's actually a very, very excellent question. If you play knight c6, white does have this option called the Rossellimo variation, okay? And this is more of a strategic type situation because White at various moments can take this knight, try to double your pawns, okay? And we do not cover that in the master method. We just make you aware of it. Later when I do an anti-Sicilian video, we will definitely cover that and we have some great ways of playing that for black. But it's more strategical in nature. 
Okay, now, if you want to play G6, there is an independent option, and we'll try to get to some games today, where white can play D4, and after takes, queen takes, and he hits the rook in the corner. Now, of course, if the knight was on C6, that would not be possible, but this is also independent, and we cover this in some depth in the master method. This variation tends to be a little bit more tactical in nature, okay? And uh, the downside to bringing the queen out early is she can get hit, okay? So we'll be recommending knight f6, and then you're following with a quick knight c6. So it's really a stylistic taste. Do you prefer the potential strategical type play that you might get after bishop to b5, and it's more oriented towards pawn structure and evaluation, or are you quite okay with the wide open slash bang tactical type style that you'll get with an immediate peace confrontation. Okay, myself, I kind of think it's good to learn both. So, but usually what I do when I'm actually working with my students and we get to this position, I'm like, which do you prefer? You could play your knight out to c6 or g6, and I let them choose, okay? So anyway, after knight c3, the first game we're gonna look at is one of my games, Sammy 2025. He's 1186 on chesskid.com, which is actually a pretty good chesskid.com rating. Okay, and he's playing public buckle. So let's see, knight c3, and then d4 takes, and then bishop g7, pressure on the knight on d4, bishop to e3 defending the knight. Now I'm going to take a quick pause here and see if I can find out how to view the chats. Okay. Actually, it looks like here I got a picture of the chats, okay? So, uh, I see Sean Gao has a vote here for G6. Vikram says hello. Okay, and C Bear is here. Okay, so I'd like to thank everyone for coming in. Charlie Brown says the screen is blurry here. Now, are other people getting a blurry screen? Please let me know. Okay, now, back to the chess game. Okay, so bishop e3, knight f6, and as I said, here we have pretty much our start position for the accelerated dragons. Okay, now we finally have our technology together. I can see my chess base, and I can see the uh, chats, okay? Okay, Charlie changed the, the resolution, and Sean says his screen's looking good. Okay, so now, now we're in business. Uh, I guess this is why when I uh, watched a few of the other grandmasters do... Uh, their webinars, they all start out with, can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, so, and by the way, I'd like to say uh, special thanks to iChess.net. Uh, I'm very honored to be in the company of players like uh, Nigel Short and I believe Judith Polgar and a few other, you know, very good quality GMs, Simon Williams, you know, have all done these uh, webinars and I just have to say I'm, I'm very, uh, very honored to be in that company. Okay, so now this is always an interesting moment is what kind of setup will white choose to attack our accelerated dragon with, okay? In the uh, master method, which is 23 hours, we focus very much on attempts by white to try and set up a Yugoslav attack formation, okay? Uh, F3 being one of those main attempts, okay? Queen to D2 is another. And basically, white wants to play F3, bishop C4, and castle. Inside that is, okay? And then, He's in business. Okay, bishop c4. That's another popular way. Okay, and that's probably the best way for white to try and go about setting up a uh, <clears throat> Yugoslav attack formation. We also spend a bit of time looking at the classical variation with bishop e2. That was a big time favorite of Karpov's in the 70s. Okay, however, in this game, and this happens time and time again in chess when you think you've seen just about everything. Uh, the guy uncorked bishop to b5. Well, now, of course, bishop to b5 does stop the d5 advance, but not to worry. He castle. And now here, white plays bishop takes c6. And this is a typical thing that uh, non-masters do, is that they will make unprovoked exchanges. And here, after d takes c6, White has gained absolutely nothing, and he's given black the bishop pair. Now, b takes c6, extra center pawn, play on the b file. This is totally possible, okay, and totally okay. 
D takes C6 is another way to go. That puts a little more pressure down the open file, okay? Now, Kasparov refers to having the bishop pair as, quote, the mini exchange, and he considers it to be about a 0 0.50 or half a pawn worth of value. <clears throat> now, here, white compounds his mistake in castles, okay? Now, if I can hide the text there. Uh, does anyone have any recommendations here about how to exploit white's castling? Pause for a moment. Okay, so John Vaughn kicks in with uh, Vicus Verma says knight to g5. I think he meant knight to g4. And in fact, John Vaughn says knight to g4, threatening the bishop. And he's absolutely correct. This is a very, very standard thing, uh, knight to g4. And as John correctly uh, indicates, we put tremendous pressure on d4 and the e3 bishop, and we can see the white position is already falling apart, okay? Now, let's take a look. Uh, Ling Hua suggested knight h5, but knight h5 doesn't really quite hit the mark, okay? In fact, white could even think about f4 or f3, but knight to g4 is definitely the ticket. Okay, now let's go back for a minute. Suppose instead of the erroneous castles, white had played f3. This is a very typical move that we see. It supports the pawn, it takes knight to g4 more or less off the table. Well, then black... And we'll see this type of theme time and time again, has very sharp move queen to b6. That hits the unprotected pawn on b2, and it starts to eyeball pressure on this diagonal. Now, of course, queen b6 is always double-edged because you are putting your queen in the x-ray line of the bishop on e3. However, play might go something like this, and these are typical type variations that you'll see time and time again. Now, notice that rook to b1, rook to d8 is just simply a nasty pin. Okay, black's already uh, starting to assume the initiative here. And if the knight moves, you'll be taking the queen off with check. So, after f3, queen b6, if knight to f5, trying to take advantage of the free discovery, you go ahead and bite the bullet, you play queen takes b2, and both white knights are under attack, okay? Now, for example, I don't give, give it in the note here, but if knight takes g7, typical uh, idea is that you take this knight, then you chill out here, and then you will see this knight here is not completely trapped because you can go bishop h6 to rescue it, but he's going to have trouble finding his exit, okay? Now, after queen b2, knight takes e7 check. You duck with the king. And if he goes bishop d4, you have the very nice move. Rook to d8, pinning. Let's take another look. If he goes knight a4, attacking your queen. Well, Fisher had the comment once that unprotected pieces lend, you know, to tactics, or as the British say, UPDO, unprotected pieces drop off. And a nice example here would be queen to b4 check. And you can see after he does something like c3, you snap that knight off, clearly extra piece, winning game. Okay? Now, let's go back. f3, queen b6. And keep in mind, before you just whip out queen b6, it's very double-edged. You do need to calculate because this knight can move away and try to discover attack on your queen. So you have to be very precise in your calculations. But after you watch the master method or wherever you see other games with this motif, you'll get a feel for when you can and can't play it, okay? But let's just take a look at some of the main line action here. Knight check, king over, and now bishop to d4. Then you have rook d8. And I was going to actually leave off here, but after knight to d5, does anyone see how black should continue here? The queen is under attack. The pin has been broken. The knight on f6 is under attack twice. Uh, looks a little dicey. However, let's see. You do have the bailout move with queen a3. So now, for example, after knight takes c8, I think the easiest is just to play rook takes. 
After knight takes f6, well, black's a piece down for the moment, but fully developed and pin win. You get the bishop back. Uh, queen b4 check here uh, is suggested, but after queen b4 check, uh, c3 still looks like it might be a little murky, but it might, it might be sufficient. But c5 is pretty simple, pretty clean incision, I think. When he goes knight d5, you play bishop takes, and you just have absolute fantastic bishop. Uh, you're not a pawn ahead, but you do have a 3 to 2 queenside majority. And one of the things that I talk about in my master method is seven, what I consider seven key principles in evaluating a position. And of course, when we first learn chess, we all learn about material. Okay, that's the first thing we learn about. Okay, but there are other considerations such as relative piece value, force, how many units you have in a sector under attack, pawn structure, okay, pawn weaknesses, space advantage, uh, color control, and qualitative superiority of pieces. Okay, so here, theoretically, material is equal, but I consider that uh, white, you know, already has severe problems. And then what I think Kasparov puts at the top of his list is king safety. So, for example, in this position after bishop takes d4, if we look at the relative king safety, this king is nice and safe over here in the corner. This king, well, he's still looking for a home, and he can't get castled yet for a while, okay? So those are some of the considerations. Now, h3 would be another move to try and keep the knight off of g4, okay? But again, it would lose a bit of time. Anyway, let's go back to the game. So in the game after castles, of course, knight to g4 happened. Now, h3. Now, knight takes, pawn takes, and then... Any thoughts on what to play here for black? Black clearly has the bishop pair. Life is good. He's got two beautiful bishops here. Okay. But any thoughts now on what to play to exploit this? Oh, uh, Ravi Rawat says, I sound a bit like Karpov, but actually... Good point, and uh, by the way, that's, that's a, a deep honor, and I appreciate it. Behind me is a picture of Anatoly Karpov, okay? Uh, previous uh, entrepreneur that I worked for sponsored some events with Karpov, and so uh, when he uh, moved off to France, this kind of fell into my living room lap, okay? So, <laughs> okay, so a couple of people, Long Hu and uh, Akeem, both uh, recommend E5, and they're absolutely spot on. When you have the two bishops, uh, does anyone know who was the first player in chess history to talk about the advantage of the two bishops? Any thoughts on who that might have been? Okay, so I think the first examples of play with the bishop pair and the first person to actually write about how to exploit the bishop pair was... Uh, well, we're getting closer. Someone said Fisher, someone said Kappa, but Charlie Brown said Steinitz, and I, I think we have to go with Charlie Brown here. Uh, Steinitz had two games, 10 years apart. One was against Bird, and the other against uh, Master English. And uh, Paul, Paulo uh, Fontour also says Steinitz. He is absolutely correct. And John Vaughn throws out Lasker, who Lasker was a superb in-game player. Uh, welcome, Jason, here to the chat. Uh, but Steinitz was the first one to actually write about the specific advantage of the two bishops. And if you have a chance to go back in chess history, eventually I or Karpov or someone will make a video on this, talk about this. Uh, Steinitz discussed his two games, very similar, 10 years apart, where he had the bishop pair. And one of the things he talks about is when you have the bishop pair, using your pawns to deprive the enemy knights of outpost. So this is kind of a classic textbook example, okay? Even if you block in one of your bishops for the moment, it can reemerge later. But the main thing is to use your pawns in such a way that you deprive these knights of outposts. So this is a classic textbook example, okay? Now, after e5, you can see the knights don't have good outposts. This pawn covers c6 and d5. This pawn takes away the d4, the f4 squares, okay? Knight retreats, and now queen to b6, okay? And someone had suggested queen b6 move before, but it's even stronger now. As we can see, the b2 pawn and the e3 pawn are definitely under attack, okay? Now in the game, queen e2 is played. 
which defends the e pawn, but not the b pawn. A little bit better would be queen c1, bishop e6, knight g5, and does anyone have any ideas about what to play for black here? All in one is here. Excellent. Sujit Yogi, okay, who, by the way, had suggested Steinitz as one of the first people. Also, I see Chesnevich also knew about Steinitz. And John Vaughn suggests bishop will come to h6 and queen to b6 target the weak pawns. He's absolutely right. In fact, right here is an ideal time for what I call bishop relocation. In a lot of the uh, sniper openings, your bishop on g7 has done its job and it can relocate to either f8 or h6. And I discussed this in a book I did, uh, uh, two volume set called the uh, Crushing White with the Sniper. And the accelerated dragons and the hyper accelerated dragons are definitely under the sniper umbrella. So we call this bishop relocation. The bishop, his job is done on this diagonal and now there's a lot of meat on this diagonal, the h6 to c1 diagonal. So here, h4 would be pretty much obligated. Now, here, bishop to g4 is an excellent move given by the computer. It would be very tempting to play f6, thinking that after knight takes, you're just going to splatter him with bishop e3, which you would. But unfortunately, and this is one of the key things in chess that I try to tell my students, is so many players get so wrapped up in what they're doing to the other guy, they forget about what the other guy could do. And in this case, knight a4 would actually give black uh, some unpleasant uh, problems because when he moves his queen, the uh, bishop on e6 can be captured, okay? So you always have to think, what can the other guy do to me? And so of course here, after bishop h6, h4, a simple move, bishop g4. You could also think about bishop c4, rook f6 and so forth, and things would be good. Okay, so you got your two bishops, he's got his weak pawns, he's going to eventually have to move his knight when you go f6, and it's not a pleasant uh, picture for the uh, white team here. Okay, so after the, in the game, after queen e6, what would we play for black here? Any, any uh, thoughts what to play for black here? Okay, remember when we played queen b6, we were attacking two pawns, right? And he only defended one. So let's, Sean Gao says, let's take on b2. And Shubman, Shubman also says, take on b2 and absolutely concur. White has no prospects for a kingside attack in the foreseeable future. And once you take that pawn, it's not just the pawn, but you also destabilize the c3 knight and you split the white queenside pawns and you gain a three to two queen side majority. So there's a lot of very good reasons to go ahead and snip that little baby off, okay? Now in the game, after queen b2, knight a4 happened. So then queen a3. Okay, now it's a bit of a form of domination. And one of the things I really look for in games and really love and uh, is when pieces trap pieces. In fact, uh, one of the things I asked Karpov about, Karpov had a discussion with him once about, you know, uh, <clears throat> I think we were talking about like how each player becomes world champion. And he pointed out that each player needed to contribute something new to the game of chess. And so that led me to the next question. Okay, uh, well, what do you feel you contributed? And he said, play against weak enemy pieces. Uh, he thinks that was really his forte. And he pointed out, for example, in the Ruy Lopez, the Chagorin variation playing d5 and sending the knight to a5 and then playing b3 and so forth. So here we can see this knight on a4 is very, very weak. In the game, queen to, uh, queen to b4, by the way, would have been extremely good because that would actually even take away the queen c4 option. So queen b4 would have been very good, okay? But queen a3 was perfectly good too, okay? And now white played queen c4 defending the knight. So, so any suggestions here? Of course, black could play queen takes on e3 check and be two pawns up, okay? But 
Any suggestions here on uh, what to play to score the knockout punch? Okay, Sean Gao says pawn fork with b5, and that certainly looks looks very uh, very tasty and very logical, and that's what we would expect. But John Vaughn recommends bishop e6. Now, the difference, though, is, again, remember, we've got to go back to what we said. You always have to think not just what am I going to do to my opponent, but what can he do to me? And if we play b5, which is very tempting, then he has queen takes c6, hitting our rook in the corner, and kind of bailing out a little. Now, black is probably still winning by just moving his bishop somewhere or something. He's still got a fantastic game. Possibly he could even sack, play pawn takes and bishop a6 and so forth. But the simple bishop e6 just simply uh, takes away any counterplay, hits the queen, hits the knight, and in fact, after queen c3, queen takes a4, uh, the evaluation is plus 6 for black. White struggled on to move 35, but we're not going to continue. Uh, clearly a winning advantage after 16 moves with black. And this is the kind of game that I teach my students. And this is why I love playing the Accelerated Dragon. It's amazing how many quick knockout wins you can get. And sometimes even against very good players because they simply aren't prepared. Okay. So, so we'll do a file save replace and we'll take a look at the next game. Uh, Okay, so next game also features the same student, Sammy2525. He's a student at my school at Miami Country Day. Okay, let's see. Let's get rid of that. Okay, so e4, c5, knight out, pawn up, pawn up, takes. Now here, knight takes. Now we did mention that queen takes d4 is definitely an option, okay, for white, okay. On the plus side, white hits the rook in the corner. It's not protected yet. We don't have our bishop to g7 yet, okay? And that doesn't disrupt our development a little, okay? But what we do with black is we play knight f6, and I cover this in great detail in the uh, master method, okay? And we're now ready to follow up with knight c6. So pluses and minuses. The early queen development subjects the queen to potential harassment by the white, uh, by the black minor pieces and pawns but it does temporarily disrupt our development, okay? Now, in, in this particular game, the opponent didn't play queen takes on d4, played knight takes, and after bishop out, bishop out, knight to c6, okay? Now note that a little finesse here, black could play knight f6, okay? And a uh, very nice comment here by Sean Gao. He said, I feel like you and Eugene Perlstein uh, Grandmaster Perlstein, by the way, was a student, a uh, very good student, by the way, of uh, Roman Jinjin Hashvili. And he says uh, he feels we're among the best teachers on the Accelerated Dragon. And, you know, I certainly hope he's right. I hope that today we all have fun and there is some danger we may actually learn something as well. That would be, that would be a huge bonus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but no, I have a lot of respect for uh, Perlstein. In fact, he had a game with Black against uh, Shirov. And I think it was like a uh, world uh, event. And Shirov actually was a little bit fortunate to actually make a draw with the uh, white pieces. So as a dragon devotee myself, I always look at other games by top-notch dragon players. And I, I take notes on uh, what they're doing. And Perlstein is one of those players on that list that I definitely pay attention to his games. You know, a lot of respect, you know, for, for him and his theoretical preparation in the, uh, in the dragon. Okay. So let's see, after knight c3, so what I was going to say, though, is that you can play knight f6, attack the pawn, and the point here is you don't have to be worried about this advance with e5 because you have the little trick queen a5 check, double attack, okay? And after knight c3, you snip off that very, very valuable center pawn. Believe me, more than one white player has uh, fallen into this because when they play e5, they're thinking, oh, the knight's going to go back and they're going to get some mojo initiative, okay? And believe me, more than one player with white has walked into this one, okay? So anyway, uh, in this game, knight c6, knight c3, and then knight f6. And as I mentioned before, I consider this to be kind of our standard start position, okay? Uh, Lynn Cooper has a question. Fire away, and we'll try to get to it. Uh, just 
Try not to ask me what the winning lotto numbers for the Powerball next week are, okay? And so, anyway, after knight f6, in this game, f3, which we mentioned, you know, is one of the logical attempts by white to start steering toward a Yugoslav attack formation, okay? Now, if we as black just let white play queen d2 and bishop c4 and castle queenside, it's a very easy plan of attack for the white team leader, okay? But it's premature here. Here we castle. Now, d5 is a little bit premature. Does anyone know why? Uh, any thoughts on why d5 would be premature, even though we want to play that? Okay, Ravi Rawat has a strange comment about instead of knight f6, e6, and knight e6 would be better. Okay, well, knight c6 is suggested, so uh, knight e7. But, but the challenge here is that be very careful with black in slamming in d5 if uh, this bishop hasn't moved, because this bishop can come out here and pin your knight, and it gets a little messy, okay? Because, like, if you play bishop to d7, then your pawn on d5 might be on pre and so forth, okay? So, there's no rush here. We know we want a castle. Let's go ahead and castle now. And now here, black plays bishop to d3. And this is a bit of a passive development. And I was thinking about this in preparation. And I, I would have to say here that uh, on the surface, this looks pretty, pretty reasonable for white, okay? He's actually occupying the center with a lot of pawns and pieces, okay? But, and this was kind of the school of thought in the classical days of chess, and then around the 1920s and 30s, a group of young independent thinkers, Rete, Tartakower, and a few others, uh, Nemzovich, kind of developed the hypermodern school of chess. And in the hypermodern school of chess, uh, they start to differentiate between actually occupation of the center, as we can see here, white is clearly occupying the center, versus controlling the center. And they started to discuss that, well, there can actually be a difference. And thus, Fian shadowing bishops came much more into prominence because a Fian shadow bishop, while it doesn't actually occupy the center, can be firing a laser beam right through the center, okay? And so here is a classic case in point of occupation versus controlling. Black now strikes out with d5. And the hypermodern school of chess even went a little step further and said, you know what, we can actually let white occupy the center sometimes and then try to counter strike at that center, okay? And so thus comes the conflict of ideas. So here black plays d5 in a heartbeat. And this is one of the reasons that we like the accelerated dragon and the hyper accelerated dragon versus the standard dragon. In the standard dragon, you would have put the pawn on d6 and you would have spent a tempo and white would have another tempo here either for queen d2 or castles or something. And then later, you would look to free your game by playing d5. And as Roman pointed out in the very first videos I watched, time and time again, boy, if black can play d5 in one shot, it's like almost instant equality. And I would even say, goes a step beyond, I tend to prefer black in these positions because white has already lost any momentum from the first move. And a lot of times black is actually able to get the initiative. Okay, so let's see. Little comment here. You want to deny outpost, okay, from C Bear. And then we got something here, potato, potato, potato. Says, is this more sound than the hyper accelerated dragon C5 G6? Uh, I think both the hyper accelerated and the accelerated are quite sound. And as I discussed earlier, I think it's a stylistic question. If you play knight two knight C6, as we discussed earlier, just to go back for a minute, we'll scroll back up here. If you play two knight c6, if you play g6, you have to think about this queen takes d4 variation, okay? If you play knight c6, you have to be prepared against bishop to b5, the Rosalimo. Now, not to say, you know, one or the other is better, but it's stylistic. Just to review very quickly, uh, if everyone else will bear with us, the queen takes d4 variation tends to be more tactical in nature which is good for players. For example, my student Charlie, uh, Charlie Brown is on the call here, and he loves wide open tactics, loves Neshmedinov, Tal games, and so this is totally his cup of tea. 
I have other students that prefer the, uh, the knight to c6 move order, okay? And don't mind the structural issues involved. Okay, so back to the game at hand after d5. Well, this totally breaks up the position, and now black has a threat. If given another move, we'll just make a t-note here. If white passes and it's black's move, well, he can already think about playing. Let's do a... Hold on, we're going to enter a null move here. Okay. Let's see, we entered it in the wrong place. Bear with me one second. Okay, so now if black had another move here, he could already slam in a move like e5, and you can see he's already starting to fight very hard for the center. And these white pieces all jumbled together are going to kind of be in the way of these uh, approaching black pawns. Okay, so d5, excellent free move. Now, one of the ways that white can respond is knight takes on c6. But after b takes c6, black actually adds to his pawn structure. And now white kind of has two different choices. Well, first off, he has to do something about the potential pawn fork, okay? Uh, Sean Gao points out that the Ross Limo is annoying, and I have to agree, and that's why definitely you have to be prepared for it, okay? Uh, now, I do not cover the uh, how to play against the Ross Limo. I will probably touch on maybe one game later in this uh, series of webinars, but I don't really cover it in depth in the master method, but I will probably cover it in a future anti-Sicilians video, okay? Uh, not to be feared, but definitely needs to be prepped against. Queen takes d4, same thing. Not to be feared if you are prepared, okay? Now, after b takes c6, white could play e5. And this is pretty standard recipe when black plays d5, either in this or the classical. And here you have a couple of options. Typical option is to play knight back to d7, and after f4, play e6, okay? And you set up your pawn triangle, and you look to play f6, and chip away at their pawn center. Now, I think uh, Charlie Brown and I had a, uh, or Charlie Brown had a game uh, a couple of months ago on chess.com. Uh, it actually takes a pretty decent positional player to fall into this trap that White fell into, but quite a few players have fallen into it. Uh, I think his opponent in this type of position played a move like knight a4, clearly wanting to occupy the c5 square, and that looks very reasonable. Now, of course, black could play f6, but the nice little tactic here is knight takes e5, pawn takes, and then queen h5 check, and we cover this in the master method. <clears throat> black will simply regain the pawn. The pawn on e5 is uh, very, very weak. White's position is a total disaster, okay? So, but after e5, another idea for black here in this particular situation is to play d4. And after pawn takes on f6, you could simply play bishop takes on f6. And after bishop h6, chase in the exchange, very thematic idea for black is to just sacrifice the exchange, take on b2, and after rook b1, king takes f8, and let's take a look. Well, seven pawns to five. We already have two pawns in our pocket, plus... Remember, we have the bishop pair, and we said Kasparov said the bishop pair is worth about 0.50. So black already actually has a big advantage here. He's also got possibilities of check picking off this pawn, and then he's got monster pawns on this side, on the queen side, okay? So that would be one way to go. Uh, so e5 is probably not very good. Pawn takes pawn is another typical response in these type of situation, situations. And you would think black would play pawn takes pawn, which is certainly okay. But even stronger is to play knight takes. And why knight takes? Well, this opens up for the sniper bishop, or the accelerated dragon bishop, if you will, okay? And you can see it puts pressure on the bishop on e3 and the knight on c3, okay? Now, after knight takes, pawn takes, the pawn on b2 is under attack, c3 is a typical move, okay? Now, any thoughts here? Okay, uh, Max Timpany, thanks for joining us, by the way, says, uh, will we cover the Moroxy Bind? Okay, great question. Moroxy Bind, real pain in the, excuse me, real pain in the ass for black if you don't know what to do. 
uh, players like Karpov, Kappa, Petrosian would play it and just botany and just slowly squeeze white, uh, squeeze black to death with the space advantage. Well, two things. One, uh, by the way, excellent question there, Max. We will cover uh, <clears throat> in some depth uh, the third part of the master class method. We give you a repertoire to play against the um, Roxy bind, but we will also touch on it uh, in the third of these webinars, which will be Wednesday at 12 o'clock noon, okay? Very, very good question, okay? Uh, so we haven't gone over it yet in these webinars, and we will plan on going over that on uh, Wednesday, okay? Uh, so keep the questions coming. We'll do the best we can to answer, okay? Let's see. Now, in the case at hand, after knight d5, knight takes, pawn takes c3. Any thoughts here on what to play for black? Uh, I think someone's suggesting uh, Shubham is suggesting e5, and uh, that would be a normal move. However, after e5, sometimes you do have to be a little bit careful about some tricks with bishop to b5 and bishop c5. Uh, in fact, bishop c5, and then bishop here. I guess you could play bishop d7 and so forth, but that is possible. And I think a uh, very good book by uh, Young I.M. from England on the uh, Accelerated Dragon uh, came out a few years ago. Uh, and he mentioned in this type of position that he actually had a slight preference for playing rook to b8 first. So that way he keeps that bishop off b5 and some variations. Uh, in the game here, we actually uh, saw my student play d4. Okay. Now, slightly more precise would be to actually play rook b8 first. Uh, having trouble remembering the name of the, uh, the young IM. Both his parents are Fide title players. And he produced a very good book around 2014 on, on the uh, Accelerated Dragon. Anyway, the idea with rook b8 is to try and get some kind of commitment. Notice the pawn can't move because the bishop takes c3. Okay. <clears throat> Lalich. Peter Lalich came out with a very nice book in 2014 on uh, playing the dragon. Very good. And I think in this type of position, he had one game where he wishes he had played rook b8 first. Okay. So rook b1 then play d4 as in the game. And the difference is after takes, takes, queen takes, uh, white doesn't have bishop e4 hitting the rook in the corner, okay? And this position's pretty good. Now, you could also play e5, bishop c5, rook e8, bishop b4, as we mentioned, okay? In the game, my student Sammy went ahead and blasted away with d4 right away, okay? Then came bishop b4. Now, of course, if bishop to e4, it's a little bit complicated. But again, you can see this type of variation would not have been possible had black simply played rook b8 first. But even here, he has very good compensation, probably close to winning. In the game, after bishop d4, bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes. Now, you can see white already has problems in terms of, remember, we said our elements, king safety. Look at that black king, nice at home, smoking a cigar or cigarette or whatever, checking out the Sunday morning paper. Look at this white king, still stuck in the middle of the board, okay? Not going to be able to castle for the foreseeable future, okay? King safety. Definitely start putting that at the top of your list when you look at a chess position to evaluate. Look at your king, look at their king, okay? And I think that'll probably help you a lot in your uh, actual chess play. So after queen takes d4, we can see the queen hits the pawn on b2, cuts off the king from castling, okay? Now... Yes, uh, Paolo says Peter Lelich. He's absolutely right. Uh, Jason mentions Andrew Martin. Andrew Martin, a long time ago, I think it was quite a while ago, did, uh, did very good videos on the uh, uh, Accelerated Dragon and so forth. And I remember also uh, with the black side of them, Roxy Bind and so forth. But uh, Peter Lelich, yeah, I think around 2014 came out with a very good uh, Play the Dragon type book. Okay. Now, here, Queen to e2, okay? Notice that bishop e4, black has two responses. What do you guys think here would be a good way? Should we trade queens and just go to the end game? What do you guys think? Well, Sean Gao is saying something about bishop d7 in the position before losing the d5 pawn. He may be right, but again, 
uh, no reason for Black to get involved. The rook b8, you know, would have been a, the most precise way to play, you know, but good point. Okay, so now in this position, what do you guys think uh, Black should play? Someone says trade queens. John Vaughn suggests queen e3 check. Someone says queen b4. Well, a couple ideas come to mind. One, if you just want to bail out, I think queen e5, simply pin that and gain time to play your rook to b8, okay? For example, if bishop e, if queen up, then you gain time to play rook b8. With the king in the center of the board, I think we definitely want to try and keep queens on the board if we can, okay? So that's one thought. However, keeping in the dragon spirit after bishop to e4, queen takes b2. Give up the rook in the corner, and then queen takes g2. And now, if rook f1, then you have bishop a6. And you can see, you've already put two pawns in your pocket. The rook on f8 is attacking the bishop on a8. The queen is threatening this rook down here on f1, and this is pretty grim. And so after rook f2, you can see white will definitely pay the price for leaving the king in the center. Queen check, check, check. Now again, no instant gratification here. Of course, you could play rook takes bishop, but at this point, you might as well go full in for the king hunt. And the game would end something like that, okay? So that's what makes the dragon so much fun to play. You're not sitting there noodling around with some positional nonsense. Not to say positional play is not bad, but sometimes you get to go right after their king. Okay, so in the game after queen d4, white played queen e2. Now... Any thoughts on what uh, Black's next move should be to try and build the initiative? Okay, C. Bear says, me is wanting kings. Well, if you want kings, definitely the accelerated dragon or hyper-accelerated dragon definitely is one of the better openings to play, okay? So John and Jason and Long and C Bear are all suggesting rook b8, and I totally agree. Absolutely spot on, rook b8. Hits the pawn, pawn can't move because the rook in the corner hangs, and so he's pretty much obligated to play this kind of limpy-wimpy rook to b1. Otherwise, really no other good way to defend that pawn, is there? Okay? So after rook b, well, I guess castles, okay? But should we take a look and see what happens if castles? Any thoughts on what the next moves should be there? Well, bishop e6 is visible down here, okay? And after king b1, how would you continue the attack here? Uh, yeah, yeah, John, we, we're looking at white castling long, and then we go bishop e6, hitting the a2 pawn, and if he goes over to defend it, what do you guys think now? Well, Jason's suggesting rook b2, which I think might be a little bit premature. Simply uh, <clears throat> keep in mind the queen is, is protecting there, okay? So that might be just a little bit early, okay? Queen a4, Sujit is suggesting, Long is chipping in with queen a4, and I kind of have to agree. Queen a4, that puts two hits on the a2 pawn. Not easy to defend. Simple threat is queen a2 check, okay? So after queen a4, pretty much obligated to play b3, okay? And now, bishop takes b3, smack, and the idea here is you sacrifice the bishop and you destroy the pawn cover. Now, one of the things I talked about, remember I mentioned the set, the seven elements or so that I focus on in a chess game. And here you can see that in the sector under attack, this quadrant here, white has a rook and bishop, eight points. Black has queen and rook. Don't really count this pawn too much, but that's about 14 and a half points of force and against this naked exposed king. So this is what we're referring to in terms of force versus material. Material, in my view, is just sum up all the pieces on the board. And here, white's doing okay. He's got a bishop for only two pawns. But in terms of force, in this quadrant here, white's in big soup, okay? Because 
black obviously has a huge force count in this quadrant, okay? So when you look at uh, chess position and you're evaluating, look at the force in a sector under attack, okay? And here we can see, yeah, it's not gonna be, it's gonna be pretty quick. Rook over d8, cutting him off, and then queen check, queen d2, and a very nice variation here is that now you go check this way, and then you hit him with this one, exchange sack, eliminate another defender, queen check. Now again, there's force, and there's material. Here, white is a rook up for only two pawns, but the force sector and the king safety are clearly not working in his favor, okay? So typical variation when you're attacking on the king side. Okay. Perfect coordination with the black army. And you can see the, uh, the white pieces in the corner not doing anything at all to help out. Okay. Now, let's get back to the game after rook b1. Very nice strong move here, rook to d8. Simply hitting the bishop on d3. Okay. Now again, relative value. Okay, is one of the things that I talk about in my uh, discussing elements and so forth. Okay, and this is all discussed uh, in the first part of my master method, and then everything I do in the future will build on these concepts of uh, the seven elements for chess. So one of the things I talk about, we discuss king safety. Let's look at the two relative kings. King on g8, very safe, very secure, good pawn cover. King on e1, mm, not much pawn cover there and still trying to figure out where his home is going to be, okay? Qualitative superiority of pieces. Let's look at these black rooks and queens lined up on open files. We see these white pieces. When you break chess down and you look at some of these elements, it can uh, demystify trying to evaluate a lot of chess positions. So let's take a look, and we'll go ahead and wrap up for today. The bishop is under attack. The bishop moves to c4, but now comes another development smacking the rook on b1. Rook goes to c1. Well, if rook to d1, typical variation would be, I'm just going to run through this right quick, trade rooks. Of course, if queen takes, you can take the bishop on c4, and then check. Now the pawn is under attack, rook over pinning the bishop, and then check, check, and you can see this would, this would end pretty quickly. So in the game after bishop c4, bishop f5, smacking the rook on b1. Rook goes to c1. Then rook takes b2. And again, you can see the qualitative superiority. If you compare the black pieces to the white pieces, it's hardly a fair comparison. Now the game is actually pretty much over. After rook takes b2, again, the king safety comparison, okay? In the game, well, if queen e7, you have simply queen f2 mate, okay? After rook takes b2, if queen f1, trying to guard the f2 square, then you have queen d2 mate, okay? In the game, after queen d1, then simply queen f2 checkmate. End of the story, 19 move win for black. And after my students win one or two games like this, they are committed, accelerated dragon, Sicilian devotees for life. And that's why I love playing this opening. If white doesn't know what to do, it's very easy for black to assume the initiative and go after the king. So join us again Monday. I think uh, <clears throat> the iChess.people will put together a link there for you uh, where you can buy the uh, master method. I think it uh, finally came out in the end to 23 hours. It includes the seven principles that I like to use, guidelines for evaluating chess positions, and it gives very thorough coverage of the accelerated dragon, White's attempts to set up the Yugoslav attack, uh, how we're going to meet that. The main variation with seven bishop to c4 is what we will cover in our next webinar on Monday at 12 o'clock. Uh, we also cover how to meet the classical variations. And the last section is devoted, someone asked earlier about the Meroxy bind. We have very special repertoire against that, and we will talk about that on Wednesday. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for taking a little time here on a Saturday to join us. And uh, I guess I'll see you again Monday. Thank you so much. Uh, what time does the next webinar start? Okay, we're all talking Eastern Standard Time. So the next webinar will be Monday, 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. And I'm not sure what that translates to for Greenwich time. But it will be 12 o'clock 
uh, Monday and 12 o'clock Wednesday on uh, Eastern Standard Time. Thank you all so much. And uh, hopefully I'll see most of you Wednesday and Thursday. Okay, take care. Yes.